everybody aboard? Yeah, red flags up. Quick. One man with a formidable enemy, the sea. Roland Morris of Penzance, probably the last of a great line of British buccaneers, entertains no romantic notions about the sea. Well, when people say they love the sea, I have to smile because it's... Just look at that. That sea is pounding those rocks, which in, say, 5,000 years' time will, will, will not be there. The sea is grabbing all the time. It's grabbing those rocks, it's wearing them away, and that is what I first thought about the sea when I was a youngster. It takes, it takes ships, grabs them, it grabs the men on them. And that was what gave me uh, an impulse to start diving. If only I could get something back, which the sea had taken. The sea is, we all know, the sea is cruel. But see what it did to the fastnet yachtsman. I mean, it'll do that at the drop of a hat. The sea will take you, it'll take anything. It's, it's got no conscience or anything else. It's, personally, I hate and detest it and loathe it. And down the years, Roland Morris has attacked the sea head on. Working exclusively in southwestern waters, he has led and financed teams of divers in an unremitting drive to restore to man what the sea has taken from him. Hundreds of square acres of seabed have been scrutinized and scoured. Has the sea done anything to you personally? It certainly has, yes. I lost w one of my boys from the sea. He drowned in the sea. A thing that I never, ever thought would happen to me. But it did, and of course, the sea's won up on me. I look on it as an enemy. You've got to be so careful. And uh, you'll never win. Nobody will ever win if they work on or under the sea. How many years ago is it now when your son was drowned? 15 years, Well done, I think that's, that's absolutely marvelous. Twenty years ago, it's all of twenty years ago, 
uh, we set out to find five underwater men of war, which we have known of ever since we were youngsters. Mind you, the team has changed over the years, don't forget, but we still have the old standbys that we call on, on them if we want them. And during those 20 years, we did find and identify five underwater wrecks. And boy, what adventures they gave us. They really did. Nothing remains as it has sunk. You know, the, the original has changed so much. It's not like the Mary Rose, who, who were very lucky to have a protected vessel. Our wrecks are exposed to the most violent seas that you can ever imagine. Everything is broken, bent, or battered. Look at this silver teapot. It was, at one time, a graceful little teapot which the captain used at his table. Which ship would that come from? This came off the Colossus, HMS Colossus. And... And how old is it? Well, she went down in 1798. When coins sink to the seabed, you don't see lovely silver articles lying in the sand. You see pebbles. And the diver has got to realize that You've got to look at everything. I was very lucky because my perambulations over the seabed were slow. I had to lean forward as if I was leaning against an eight-force wind, a gale. And uh, now they swim easily over, and they can miss things. They must look at everything. You see, crack them open. The sea has corroded them. So every pebble is terribly important. Silver is beautiful, as you, as you can see. I mean, it, it, it's, it's, that's, they've been under the sea for, since 1707. And uh, gold is a noble metal. Gold will not corrode. You can put gold in acid and all sorts of things, and it, it, it'll last. I remember well the first gold coin we, we found on uh, Sir Claire de Chevelle's association, his, his flagship, from which we got quite a, an amount of treasure, of which we're not frightfully proud, actually, because we got a lot of other very valuable things, such as guns. But uh, I remember a diver coming up with a gold coin in his hand, and it was just as if it had been minted. And he said, believe it or not, he said, I found that lying on top of a, an iron cannon. He said, it had probably been wafted there by the tide, taken up and just laid gently on there. And he said, there it was. And he said, the feeling I got as if was so clearly as put it there and they are, boy, there's, there's your starters. We were the first to find treasure. And the news was flashed around the world in a minute. The word at that time was treasure, treasure, treasure. For land's sake, don't drop it. Oh, I'm glad I've come today, Roy. Really. Don't drop oh, that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Who's thinking that one, huh? Oh, well, we're Dick Wilson on champagne tonight, Mark. On you, eh? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on, uh, on someone. <laughs> Oh, magnificent. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. This is your personal treasure chest. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, it's a, it's a real one, you know. It's a real German chest. And... Uh, it seems pretty full. It's, yes. Well, it should be. We've been working hard enough for over the years. Just how many coins uh, have you brought up from the sea? Well, I won't say how many, but uh, we'll say several hundred weight, shall we? Now, this is like pirate's treasure, isn't it? What sort of <laughs> coins do you have? Pieces of eight are the ones that fascinated me when I first started bringing them up. We've got, uh, I believe I got one here, a gold coin worth 800 pounds, I suppose. Really? It's a, an eight rails. Beautiful coin. 
Spanish. Mark, yeah, Spanish. Mark found that on the Romney site. And uh, it's, it's, it's lovely. It's, uh, it's really heavy. Any more gold? Gold, yes. Lots of gold. They're all Reese pieces. But uh, I must show you another little treasure we have. You know when a man puts his money together like this and uh, sort of works out the crowns from the half crowns, like that, for instance. You see, you would do that. Well, one of the sailors on board the association did that probably an hour or two before she struck, thought, right, I've got so much money to go home with. And he put it in his pocket. And that is what happened. In his trouser pocket, he drowned. And of course, that was his, his savings. And I think that's very sad, very sad. Just imagine what those pockets of, and the beer that's bought and the, and the women and so on. The very sound of them is, uh, is terrific. They've got a sound. I think it, well, sometimes I wake up in the night and I hear this, you know, and I feel very good. How's that? That's marvellous. Roland Morris has recovered enough relics to stock a celebrated private museum in Penzance, which has become an established tourist attraction. And he personally restores many sea-damaged works of art. I started diving, I suppose, when I was about 20, and that was in about 1927. 27? Way back. I'm 73. I nearly said 74. 73, really? you see? So, see, I, I get on with stuff like this. When was the first time you went underwater? Uh, when I was... 18, I went to, I, gave, I had my first lesson in Penzance Harbour in the helmeted suit. I gave uh, a couple of chaps uh, a few pints and they let me go down in the harbour. Unfortunately, on, the, on my suit, there was a, what they call a spitcock. You, this is, <laughs> this is a thing that, if your front glass misted it over, which mine very often did, because I used to get so nervous, you suck in a mouthful of salt water and squirt it over the glass, that clears it, you see. And they never told me anything about this. I, d I didn't know anything about it at all. And all the time I was walking around the harbour, the, the water was bubbling in or seeping into my suit, and it gradually got up to here. I didn't know it. And when they asked me to come, or when they gave me the signal to come up, I couldn't. I just filled my air with, well, all I could fill was my helmet with compressed air, you see. And uh, they realised so they sent down the derrick wire from the, uh, with the winch and um, hauled me up, you see. I put, put the wire around me and they hauled me up. And then they found that they had to haul me up by my feet to let the water out. I took, the, took my helmet off and the glass. And there I was swinging up like a shark, you see, the water pouring out over my neck. And, that was your first and then they carefully informed me that if I'd stumbled and fallen underwater, I would have drowned inside my suit. So that, that didn't help, really. Right, our ladies and gentlemen, lot number one then is a double sheave block with its eye. Yes, there it is. Would you say five pounds for that one, please? Put it in. Somebody say five pounds for it. To finance his war with the sea, Roland occasionally sells some of his underwater harvest, and his team do bring up a bewildering variety of nautical bric-a-brac. The 17th century Spanish metal helmet. The rim is riveted. Yes, yeah, 20 pounds for it. 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. 100 at 90 pounds in, 100 and off, all done at 90 pounds. Fine, if you like. And ship's brass, telegraph, Jean Gouget, 50 pounds, 40, 50, 50, 60, at 50 pounds, 60 now. Carved figurehead of a young woman in green dress with gilded star decoration from the Julien Marie, large girl. Say 500 pounds, Rip, 500, 600 now. 19th century flintlock pistol, there it is, carved walnut mount, brass pommel. Now the carved figurehead of a young woman with the brown hair. Yes, another nice figurehead there. Now the double-headed 
equestrian figurehead, probably came off the Queen Anne, 500 pounds writ, 500, 750, 750, 1,000, 1,200, 1,200, 1,400, 1,400, 1,600, 1,600, 1,800, 2,000, at 1,800 pounds now, 2,000 I want, at 18, 2,000, 2,000, 200, 2,200, 2,300 if you like. At 2,200, 2,300, 2,400? No, 2,300. The auctioneer's gavel is often preceded by the blacksmith's hammer. Roland is an expert on the mechanics of 18th and 19th century ships of the line and can draw detailed plans to replace corroded parts. His special affection is reserved for naval guns. He's recovered them by the score and invariably tries to bring them back to full life. Oh, it's just do it. Money. Uh, I think you can get it more, more now. I call that a lovely job. Yeah, that's like a good job. Like a job. Like a job. <laughs> <laughs> that's the superman. No, that's all right. Huh? She's all ready to go. Yep. Ready indeed to fight again as it once did against the French and Spanish men of war. Now we are ready for the language, all of it. Now. Got to put all that in, Roy. Well, no, I'll put a few bits in, just to make a few whistling noises. Yeah. Not a cannonball, Roland. No, it's this is language. This is horseshoe nails cut up and uh, even bits of horseshoe. And yeah. Stick it all in. Vicious looking things, isn't it? That's Terrible. what we used 200 years ago. Yeah. This is the French invention. It would be, wouldn't it? That's right. Lovely. Now. <laughs> now, we want the rammer again, please, Dale. All right. Thank you. Oh, just a little drop now, really. Now, we've got to prime her. Right. right. This is the best kind, is it? This is the very best you can get. 5x, four gold medals. This was the first tin we brought up off the uh, Colossus, you know. <laughs> and it's amazingly dry, isn't it? For the, you imagine doing this for the even deck. And well, fancy with the enemy approaching, you know. It's yeah. About 10 knots. <laughs> <laughs> this should be a whizzer. Fire. Fire. Fire? Yeah. Fire! <laughs> Oh, misfire. <laughs> well, you can't complain about that, can you? Hey? Honestly, you can't complain about <laughs> Well, we'll have to do that again. Oh, she's all right. Is she hot? No, no. All right. Let's go. I think you mentioned that. I believe it's cured my deafness. <laughs> you mentioned that these guns are sometimes more. Can't, can't hear a word. <laughs> Kate's dress looks nice, Mrs. Fry. Thanks. I always take great care with my washing. Of course, but it could be better, you know. What? It could be better. Your powder got it clean, but not really soft and fresh. What powder can do all that? New Bold 3 Cap. It's an entirely new concept in automatic powders. We've taken a fabric conditioner for softness and fragrant freshness, plus Bold Automatic for its superb cleaning, and combined them in one revolutionary automatic powder. Bold 3 Automatic. 
cleans, softens, and freshens all in one. It's true. My whole wash is really clean. Look at Kate's jeans. Even the knees. My towels are soft and fluffy and, mmm, so fresh. Now I know. Bold 3 Automatic does do it all. Cleans, softens, and freshens all in one. Cook is it the most refreshing way to make the most of every day? And wherever you go and whatever you do, there's something big waiting for me and you. Coke is it the biggest taste you've ever found? Coke is it the one that never lets you down? Coke is it the most refreshing taste around? Coke is For anyone who's ever wanted a slightly closer shave, Philips introduced the remarkable Philly Shave Double Action. One blade gently lifts the hair out, then a second blade cuts it, shaving you two hours closer than we've ever done before. The new Philly Shave Double Action. It could keep you smoother. Two hours longer. Strongbow. When you fancy a change from the usual. Create a sensation. Misty or. in the Christmas mood. Oh, Henry, may I please intrude? By Jove, it's Barry. What have you there? Lots of goodies from you know where. I think he means from Brute. Yes, Christmas gifts from Brute 33. Very tastefully wrapped, you must agree. So give someone close the perfect gift. Give him Brute 33 on the 25th. We said Brute 33 on the 25th. We said Brute 33 on the 25th. We said Brute 33 on the 25th. of Scilly. For Roland Morris there is no richer hunting ground in British waters. The seabed is littered with wrecks. Entire fleets have perished here. Make a line fast. There's yeah, uh, yeah. apparently marks over there now anyway. Oh, I think we'll be alright today. I think we're getting yeah. up today. Oh, yeah. I bet the trawler will have a slick or two, won't he? Roland kept a team of divers permanently stationed in the civvies on a ceaseless underwater patrol. It led to the location and recovery of the historically priceless second Hamilton collection of ancient pottery. Lady Hamilton, Lord Nelson's mistress, entrusted it to Admiral Sir Cloudsley Chevelle as he set sail for England. He never arrived. Sir Cloudsley made a slight error of navigation and his squadron collided with the Isles of Scilly. So, did you... You were down yesterday, did you see any sign of... One? Can you locate... One? The fragments of pottery were painstakingly picked out of the silt by Roland's team and pieced together by the British Museum. Right. And the visibility well, they've, they've, they've isn't very bad. A ton, aren't they? That's underwater. I should think so, yeah. yeah. this trip, Roland seeks one of the Admiral's cannon. His divers have seen it, but up to now the sea has defeated all attempts to bring it to the surface. They have rough bearings on its position, but there are problems.
one impediment is seaweed. Forests of the stuff flourish on this seabed, obscuring the diver's view. This way, I should, outside. Yeah, if you, if you can, uh, looks like all sorts in this, Roland. No, I don't think we got much of a find here. We're still in line. Alright, that'll probably come off there. Got it. That's it, Roland. Good. That can go overboard, can it? Just so I just ball. lose it again now? Yeah, chuck it over. If this was valuable, we wouldn't be doing it this way. That's we would be enough, squeezing yeah. it in a press. It's not a very pleasant smell either, is it? it smells it's of <laughs> you notice it smells of gunpowder. Mm. There's eh? a ram shot in there. Is there? Yeah. So there is, I believe. Well, I say there is. I, I, it looks very much like the Mark Beach. Oh, 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 well done. Oh, that's a nice one, Rowley. Yeah, you. Everything you know, yeah. Everything was cracky. I wouldn't like to walk very far with one of these. <laughs> no, isn't that lovely? Oh, we might have caught that in the gut, I must admit. <laughs> Actually, it's a cracker, isn't it? Yeah, oh, beautiful. This is where we, we moved from, Mark. We moved from there. Yeah. Interesting relics are found, but the cannon Roland came for remains elusive. We have problems. We have yeah, problems, we have problems. Uh, yes. When the cannons were originally found, all the weed was cut away from them, but uh, consequently with the sea and one thing or another, let's take it all that up. So we've got to relocate these, and unless you drop exactly on top of them, See, it's a hell of a job. Dive. It's not possible that uh, other divers have been down there. No, no, no. Do you ever, ever have any problems for Not now. The uh, the new act has been uh, in for since 1973. No, we don't get any problems now. What did have before? Oh, <laughs> did we? Yes. Yeah. What happened? Oh, terrible. Oh, the cowboys were really on our trail. We find the wrecks and they come and dive on them. But you don't get that now. What sort of trouble did you have? Uh, well, on the association, we actually, uh, there was one day when we had seven teams diving on one wreck. One particular day on the association, we went down and we'd been working a gully the previous day, it was several days prior to that, and uh, the, the, one of the other divers working with me was just in front of me, and he happened to see a member of another group down there with his head down in our hole. And uh, before I didn't even think, and I had I thought I probably wouldn't have stopped him, but before I could stop him, one I was with went in and pulled the other guy's mask off and his <laughs> mouthpiece out and forced him to head for the sky. Oh Not very good diving practice in 80 foot of water, but um, it had the desired effect. It must have been half a dozen press boats yeah. uh, going around, including these seven other teams. Mm. They all had little pork pie hats on, you know, all these press men, and they uh, frightfully out of place. It was quite exciting at the time. It was like a regatta. Except mm. underneath, it was quite serious, really. It was all sorts of things happening. <laughs> Finally, persistence pays off. The cannon is located. Back. <laughs> the 
looked like a double one, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a bit. Is the echo coming through the hull? <laughs> as long as it's not the water. <laughs> It takes an explosive charge to persuade the sea to finally part with it. But another battle is won. And a boat with lifting gear is chartered. That's a circle, a nine. Yeah. That there must be there's else probably there. another figure there, I should yeah. think. Yeah, well, that's silly good, isn't it, boy? Right. Hey? Shake hands. Yeah, that's, that's first class. Roland Morris never tires of the taste of victory. He is unable to resist starting work on restoration immediately. Ah, that's, a, that's better. Yeah, that's a good idea. Well, I'm not really sure. It's, uh... Is that, is that part of the metal? Yeah. It's a lovely piece, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Not all Roland's exploits have been underwater. Not quite. Frequently, he has been called by owners and insurance companies to recover items from ships on the point of sinking. Perhaps the most memorable concerned the Bessemer City, which broke her back on the North Cornish coast in the winter of 1936. Lloyds of London desperately wanted the ship's papers and a special gyro compass. At great personal risk, Roland brought them ashore. But it was a vessel of 5,600 tons, and the cargo was immense. I don't think I shall ever see such a sight again in all my life because it was an enormous hold. And all I could see were thousands and thousands of highly colored tins with labels of every description and color. They were just in one huge mass, thousands upon thousands. Well, then the, the next day, the salvage officer came on board. He came over our blonde in wire, which greatly daring, I can tell you. And uh, he said, you've done a most magnificent job. We've got this, just what we 
promised the owners and we can't do any more. So I held up one of these swollen tins. I managed to make sure it was swollen and battered. I said, well, what are we going to do with this lot? They said, look at it. It's, it's, you know, it's terrible. It's all in the way. It's cluttering up everything. He said, we, we're not interested. We don't care a damn about it. He said, I said, well, could we have some? Should we have a bloody lot if you like? And so those few words gave us the go-ahead for one of the most fantastic projects I've ever been concerned with. We got off literally scores of thousands of tins. We paid the crew by giving them 48 tins of sockeye salmon a day. <laughs> God, knows, God knows what they did, but of course they sold them, I suppose. For about the next three or four months, we didn't use any ready cash. We paid for everything with tin, uh, tins of salmon, tins of fruit. Uh, go, go to a garage for pet, fill up with petrol. Go to the boot, take out a couple of dozen tins of fruit or whatever they wanted. And this is what happened throughout the whole of the southwest of Cornwall. St. Dives, of course, was the center of it. Our headquarters was the sloop. Uh, I was very friendly with, with the proprietor then and his lovely daughter. We made another store out on the main road to Zena, a sort of a council yard, and uh, we built a very large shed of cases of fruit and, and salmon. People in the know would lift back the tarpaulin and enter it's like entering the, the, the pyramids, you know. Was, the walls were 10 feet thick, and you went through this passage, and inside were the, our headquarters, you see. <laughs> it was laughable, really, when the tins came up without labels, which the lower tins did, of course. They, the labels were all in a mass at the bottom of the crates. You could tell the contents by the swish of, or the swoosh or the plonk inside if you shook them and and uh, very often we'd, we'd sell these mystery tins without making any mistakes saying well that's a tin of figs lovely they, they sort of grate a little bit as you shake them you see and uh, we never had any complaints at all but uh, we were looking through the manifest one day and we found that in the strong room which was way down under uh, low water uh, there were five pink mink fur coats going to harrods uh, they were trial or sample coats. I happened to mention this to, uh, to the dolly bird in the sloop at the time, and she couldn't do enough for us from that day on. When are you going to bring out these fur coats, you see? Well, it was quite a job to get at them, but when we did get down there, we found that they were in plastic zip bags, and not only did the bags hold fur coats, but it all also held, held a mass of fuel oil as well. Black, sticky, stinking fuel oil. So we brought these out on deck, we hung them up on their hangers on the rail and said, now there you are, there's about 20,000 pounds worth of fur coat. Who's going to throw them overboard? So I had to. I just chucked them overboard, you see. And we sort of felt very, very sick about this. But it wasn't, it was only about two years after I was telling a furrier about this, and he said, tell me again, he said, why were you worried about them being in fuel oil? I said, well, we don't have fur coats in fuel oil. He said, you do, you know. He said, we clean fur in, in fuel oil. He said, my God, the fuel oil has to be purified. But he said, we could have, we could have brought those back to as good as new. So you threw away. So when I look back, yeah, I threw away five, pink, mink, whatever they are. Beautiful sample fur coats. Just check them over. They're out here somewhere, where they were. <laughs> The most fascinating wreck off the entire southwest coast slid down to the seabed here almost 200 years ago. And it has tantalized treasure hunters ever since. Its identity is obscure, but it is undoubtedly Spanish, for silver dollars minted in Spain began to regularly wash up on the beach, causing such excitement that the name of the place changed by popular usage. It became known as Dollar Cove. 
Countless attempts have been made over the years to get at the dollars, but no one even succeeded in locating the precise position of the wreck, until Roland Morris took up the challenge. Seven years of patient research and a little luck finally yielded the answer. He decides to fling all his resources into an attempt to prize the dollars out of the sea and gathers his team to plan the assault. So what do you reckon about it? I reckon it's, it's sand and, well, we and just want fine a, weather. There was a big current there yesterday. Yeah. She went ashore in 17, uh, 1787 and they first started uh, working on trying to find the dollars in 1845. And uh, there was a story of a lady who woke up one night and had a sort of a dream that she must go down to the cove. She went down with a bucket and she filled it half full. This is a story. No reason why it shouldn't be. And uh, they, the, I think the last one was found about 30 years ago. The museum or uh, two around here have got them. And I'm quite sure that people do find them now and again. Have you ever seen one? My dear boy. Boys? Have you ever seen one? No. Sure? I've never seen one off that rig. No. You haven't. You old. A dollar from the <laughs> dollar wreck. Now, how's that? That's lovely. That's a beauty. Isn't that beautiful? What's the date now? 1764, I believe. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Is yeah, that? 64. You can definitely. Now, isn't that they have a silky fe <laughs> feeling, don't they? They do, yeah. <laughs> The parochial uh, records, the church records of Cornwall, say there are two tons of those down there. Two and a half tons. Doesn't get the half ton. I've known about it ever since I was a baby. I mean, the dollar wreck where people go down at four o'clock in the morning still do. You see footprints that if you went down, have you ever been down four o'clock? No. <laughs> what? I think I was, saw some footprints of yours once. I know. Because I've been, I went down half past three once. <laughs> jingle, jingle. I mean, you still <laughs> see footprints. You should come down a bit now. Come down a bit. Knowing exactly where the dollar wreck lies, however, is no guarantee of success. The problem is sand. Hundreds of thousands of tons of sand. Storms pile it on the site and sometimes take it away. That's good enough, you know. Okay. Yes. Recently, the direction of the wind has not been favorable. Roland decides to attack with explosives in quantity. Hold it by that line. I don't even know where it is. Good oh, I've put my hand through it. The other rocks are showing, the yeah. bigger ones. Oh, the bigger ones, yeah. the outer rock, the flatter one, has totally disappeared. This means that uh, with the outer rock showing, which is our only mark that we are possible to take, the rise and fall of sand, that as far as this summer is concerned, we'll have to pack it in. It's ridiculous to go on. We know by the, the cove itself, the sand has built up, but since last October, it's, it's continually built up. 
Well, it might explode. I mean, couldn't you put explosive. a real shot? Ah. Well, explosive. I could explode right now. I could blow myself up because, you know, you're, it's, it's, I'm not going to say it's hopeless by any means. No fear. We don't say it's hopeless, but by God, you, you, we've used explosives by the ton. I don't know. It's, it's, uh, very disheartening if you really got down to the nitty gritty. You're not going to give up? Oh no, then God no, I, that would be terrible. You said defeat just now, it's not a defeat really. It's uh, a delay. Very de the, the sea is using delaying tactics, so you are. It, it does everything it possibly can to torture. Winter, when diving is not possible, Roland visits Dollar Cove after every storm to try and gauge the sand levels. In his line of work, patience is an essential virtue. But then another entirely unexpected factor occurs. So, if there's any messages, you know where to send them. Thanks. Right. Can you drive down? Yeah. Yes. The Cornish National Trust hear about Roland's bid to recover the dollars. They own the estate, which includes Dollar Cove, and they've come across evidence of certain feudal rights. In days gone by, I got used to the enemies that one met in diving, the sea itself, of course, enemy number one, and what an enemy. Gales, shifting sand, poor visibility, the lot. But would you believe it? Over the western horizon has appeared another enemy, accompanied by bombast, hard words, threats, the lot. Go on. The Cornish National Trust, believe it or not. People who are supposed to dispense of light and goodwill, good cheer, help you here, help you there. And they have stopped me working in this wreck. They are claiming ancient rights, the ancient wreck rights of 15 or the 16th century. Now I ask you. Well, are they still valid, those rights? In no way are they, of course not. I, I certainly don't recognize them. Michael Trenick is the head of the National Trust in Cornwall. Do you have this particular right with other, other estates? No, not in this form, because it is a very special one. It's not just the right of wreck cast on the foreshore. It's the right to any wreck which is within the range of a barrel floating in the sea as you stand on the cliff and look at it. Uh, we'll have to cast the barrel in to see how far we can see it. So this particular right, which is vested in this mm. manner, has unfortunately led to a dispute, has it not? Um, it has, but I think it need not. How did it arise from your side? simply that uh, we heard that Mr. Morris was having a go at this wreck, and we reminded him that the Trust had this peculiar and historic right. And the way they set about it, just about upscud everything that we've been doing. Upscud is a Cornish word for buggering up, if you like. They sent me a letter out of the blue from their solicitors saying that they would take out an injunction in the High Court if I ever went near this wreck again. That was the first communication? That was the first communication. A pleasant, very pleasant way of dealing business, uh, business you know. He, he felt that uh, we were being unnecessarily pernickety, 
And I think he also thought that we were after a large share of the loot. Well, that is not the case. We're much more interested in the history of it. We would like to see him recover it. How large a share of the loot are you after? Um, we don't know, because we have no idea what sort of money we're talking about. His information is much better than ours on this subject. But uh, the trust is a charity. We would like to see a small sum. But certainly uh, not anything of the order of 50%, which I understand has been talked about. These people are trying to claim the rights of a wreck that is sunk out of sight. The Lord of the Manor could never have got that. He had no divers in those days. A grapnel, if, if the vessel was above or on hard seabed, but here you have 12 to 18 feet of moving sand. Nothing worse than that for a salver. One of the conditions that you laid down before a meeting could be arranged was that he revealed the precise location of the wreck. Yes. Well, I think that's a fair enough condition to lay down because, for one thing, we have to know whether it's in the distance the spell floats from the shore, don't we? They sent me a questionnaire, and what, how old was he, why was I born, who was my mother, and all that sort of thing. But, uh, um, which I ignored. But they wanted to know, and question number one, please give us a detailed description of where the wreck is lying. Me, to tell strangers, foreigners they are, to me, where the wreck is lying. 200 years people have been spending money and searching and being half drowned, finding it, trying to find it. So I, I just said, right, that's the end of it. Let them have it. And let's see what a mess they'll make of it. Let them spend some money on it. I spent, I mean, we've been working on, on this off and on, when the weather permits, for 10 years. You see, one of the other conditions we are keen about is that if interesting things turn up, not just silver dollars, but other things, that some of them, at any rate, should stay in Cornwall, in some museum where they can be seen, and not all sold. Well, Mr. Morris has a splendid record in that direction. He has a museum. He also has regular sales, and there's no indication that the things in his museum will not be sold. Oh, yes, he's also restored the second Hamilton collection of pottery to the nation. Yes, I, I think that's a very noble act. I give him full marks for that. Would you say that Mr. Morris's attitude has been unreasonable? I think it's been erratic. Then he's that sort of chap. He's a buccaneering sort of fellow, and you don't expect him to give you a reasonable answer always. And has the National Trust's part in it been gentle? Polite. Um, but tough, yes. He says, you see, that you have threatened him with an injunction. Yes, we have done that. That was just to bring him to heel, and I hope that we could talk. As far as I'm concerned, they can go to hell and high water. I would like to see him first in the field. He's done a lot of the field work. But there are a number of other people who are ready to step in if he decides not to. When those dollars come out of that wreck down there, and we know pretty well where they are, it's not going to be any credit to the National Trust. Let me really well tell you that. They're going to come in to my museum in Penzance, brought up by my own boys, dollars like that, real silver Mexican dollars. Roland, are those from the dollar rack? That's a question that I would rather not answer, if you don't mind.